Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our first meeting of the of the autumn term, as it were. Um, <clears throat> this meeting is on Zoom, and uh, our next meeting in October will be by myself talking about the need for more science in philosophy. But um, we're still wondering about holding Zoom and uh, and in the institution meetings. Uh, the October one will be on Zoom. And then after that, we'll be taking a, a decision depending on the circumstances. I did say in my newsletter um, to let me know what, how you feel about it, but uh, no, no one has answered. So I, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> for this evening, it would be helpful if you could uh, make sure that you keep your microphone switched off uh, on mute and uh, also the camera off uh, until the time for questions comes. And they will be looked after by Andreas. Um, so this evening, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Bruce Hood, who has spoken to us uh, in the past. But uh, this evening looks a very interesting subject on the boundary between psychology and, and philosophy. And it's a question of why we want to possess things. Professor Hood, good evening. Uh, well, good evening, and thank you for taking the time out this wonderfully summer's evening uh, to uh, sit and watch a talk online. Uh, hopefully, I'll reward your efforts and time uh, with some insights that maybe you hadn't considered. Uh, when I got this invitation a few weeks back, Don asked me to speak about The Self-Illusion, which is a book, I, my second book. And I said, well, I can do better than that. I'm going to talk about my most recent one, uh, this book, Possessed, which was uh, actually published at the end of two. 2019, so unfortunately, right in the middle of the pandemic, it wasn't a lot of opportunity to promote it. But anyway, uh, it's a book which covers uh, psychology, a bit of philosophy, uh, evolutionary psychology, and, and some aspects of economics. It's ambitious, and there's a lot in there, but I thought I'd give you a, a flavor of some of the more relevant points about it. But a little bit about my background. Because uh, I did start off as a psychologist at Dundee University. I did my undergraduate degree, but then I went into neuroscience. I went to Cambridge and I studied the brain mechanisms of eye control. We call them saccades in very young babies. And the reason I was interested in that is because the baby's brains are developing very rapidly. And so I was interested in how a changing developing brain influences behavior. I then took a detour, went to America to MIT, where I started to work on irrational thinking in children and in adults. And then I took a faculty position at Harvard where I stayed for about five, six years before coming back to UK, to Bristol, to the chair of developmental psychology here at Bristol University. Now, I've had um, a diverse range of interests. Uh, I'm fascinated by many aspects of the mind, um, but I suppose one of the unifying features is that I'm really interested in those things that we take for granted that at first seem obvious, but then when you consider them a little bit more closely, you realize things are not as they seem. And I think ownership is one of these very familiar terms. It's a concept which controls our lives. If you think about it, what we do, uh, where we go, uh, how we behave is controlled by laws. And many of these laws relate to property. Uh, they relate to uh, where you can go and so on. But like this devil's fork here, although it seems fairly unsurprising, when you start to drill down and look a little bit more closely at ownership, you discover it's a little bit stranger or a little bit more unusual uh, than you first imagined. So that's what I really enjoy about the things I write about. I'm trying to find those things that we think are non-controversial, but actually when you start to look at them a little bit more closely, they seem to be that much more fascinating. Anyway, let me begin with a big picture uh, scenario, because I think this talk today has implications more than just about ownership. It has implications for our life uh, and for the way we live our lives and indeed for our, uh, for our offspring. This is the planet Earth, of course, very familiar. Uh, it's about 4.6 billion years old. And to give you some context, consider that as a 24-hour clock, okay? It's about 4.6 billion years. On the 24-hour clock, our species, Homo sapiens, appeared on that clock around about five seconds to midnight. So our species hasn't been very long here, very long on the planet. 
If you then consider the individual lives that we can expect, you know, three score and 10 or four score and 10 these days, our own individual lives are even shorter. And what I'm trying to convey here is the brief sort of moment that we all experience and have, this opportunity that we have. The fact that we're even here on this planet is also extremely rare. Uh, if you consider the fact of all the countless sperm and all the countless eggs that never met, and yet we were conceived and we were born and we live um, on this planet during the, a time of, I think, relative wealth and prosperity and certainly in this part of the world. But how do we spend this precious moment? Well, I would argue we squander it. I would argue that we are so obsessed with the accumulation of material wealth that we really have forgotten the, the value of, of, of our lives on this planet. Because I think sometimes the pursuit of wealth can actually undermine detract from the real positive aspects of, of living. So this is a quote from the book uh, to try and convey what I feel is this frustration I, I see in so many people who are striving. Uh, we come into the world with nothing and leave with nothing, but in between on this brief moment on life stage, we strut and fret over possessions as if our life is, uh, existence is defined by what we can own. It almost sounds a bit Shakespearean. I'm sure he was an influence in that, but the point is, we are obsessed with accumulating things. Not everyone, of course, but it's a particular obsession in Western society and, and recent Western society. Take, for example, this photograph. Now, this is actually one of a series of photographs taken in the 1970s. So it's a little bit out of date, but it's supposed to be the itinerary or the household possessions of a typical middle-class Midwestern American family. And you'll see in this photograph that there are some familiar things. There are household appliances, modern conveniences that we couldn't imagine living without. But if you actually look at a lot of what people have, a lot of it is just basically junk. And what's surprising is that actually many garages, which were really built to hold cars, now really tend to sort of house the overspill of all this detritus, all these possessions, all this stuff that we have, because we have this real problem of overconsumption, but also of recycling and letting go of it. Now that's getting better. And I think um, one of the messages I'm gonna leave at the end of the day tonight is that I think we can change. And I think that the, the buds or the seeds of change are certainly taking root. But about five years ago, when I was thinking about this book, it struck me that we are just really on the wrong path because of overconsumption. Because the, the problem with climate change, is not entirely down to, consumerism, but it plays a very large role. So don't get me wrong. I'm not against wealth. I'm not a communist. I'm not denying that there's some real value in the pursuit of success. Um, most of us live in Bath. This is a, a, an area of comparative wealth, affluence relative to other parts of the country. I'm not chastising anyone zooming, zooming in tonight on technologies. But what I do want to draw attention to is it, it's the relentless pursuit and the overconsumption, which I think is something that we need to reassess and to think about. Because the motivation for doing that, I think, can be traced to really deep psychological issues and concerns. Moreover, my, my concern is partly driven by the fact that there is a belief that if you have more things and you're more wealthy and more successful, you will become a happier person. Now, I give you. I could give you a whole nother lecture series on this. I, I teach a course at Bristol called the Science of Happiness, and this is one of the, the 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 assumptions that I challenge. That it's not always the case that wealth brings happiness, and I'm sure many of you can attest to that. You will know people who are not that happy, and yet they're very wealthy. So I think we could have an argument maybe in the Q and A later on about really is there something about the pursuit of wealth. But what I would like to stress is that for some of us, there's a very unhealthy relationship with our material possessions and our wealth. And that's something that I think we've got to understand why. It can be so unhealthy that people make themselves physically ill. They work themselves to the bone. You know, prior to the pandemic, some of us will remember the commuter trains uh, going into London, people spending eight hours commuting, things, ridiculous uh, concessions in the relentless pursuit of, of wealth. So I think that it definitely has questionable connection or that this is what we should be pursuing. I'd like to tell you a, a slight tale to make that a little bit more obvious. So this is a, the tale of uh, the Royal Charter, which is a ship which sank off the coast of North Wales 
1859, returning from the gold fields of Australia with the loss of over 600 lives. Now, what makes this tragedy all the more worse is that many of the passengers who died, who drowned, drowned because they were dragged down by the gold that they had sewn into their belts and their clothing, and they wouldn't relinquish this. They, they held on to it, and it was their folly because that ultimately ended in their deaths. Such is the emotional power and the emotional uh, attraction to wealth. It's a very difficult thing to let go. Now, you might think, oh, well, you know, I wouldn't do that. Of course, I would throw away my wealth. I wouldn't let go. But Every year we hear examples of people who are physically injured because of their um, overzealous protection of their property. And I've got an example here, which uh, comes from around about, I think it was two years ago. Um, and this is a bit of footage from American TV show showing how uh, a modern owner is protecting his property to the point of almost risking his life. We're here on High Street, and this is the driveway where police say the SUV was stolen. The owner wasn't going to let them get away so easily, and like you said, jumped on top of the hood. And we have video of the wild ride. This is surveillance video from a neighbor's doorbell camera. First, you can hear yelling. Then an SUV speeds by with a man on top flailing his legs and screaming. Police say he held on for more than a mile as the suspects drove towards Bridge Street. That's where he was flung off of his vehicle. A friend of the man says he's a construction worker in his 50s and lives here with his wife and daughter. He's a tough guy. He's an athletic guy. He's a guy that, you know, wouldn't back down to, uh, to any conflict that he might have. Well, I don't know about you, uh, but I certainly wouldn't uh, risk my life for the value of a car, especially if it's probably a rental or it's on lease hire. But there's something very uh, acute about the violation of property. Uh, one of the most traumatic aspects of being burgled is the trauma that it leaves afterwards, because people feel this is a violation of their, their boundaries. And so we have this very strange relationship with the things that we own. And I think part of the reason that we find it difficult to relinquish this is because it's part of our identity. And I'll be telling you a little bit about that in, in a moment or two. Anyway, let's get back to the origins of owning things and possessions and, and accumulating stuff. It's actually, we're not the only animal in the world that has possessions. Um, possessions are recognized by a variety of species. Uh, if we talk about our most closest uh, cousins, these are the primates, and this is a, a capuchin showing that they can, um, they can make tools. Uh, a number of species make tools, but one thing which is common to all of them is that they abandon them after they've used them. They will recognize territories, they'll fight over food, they'll fight over possessions, they're competitive on all these sorts of things. But we are the only species which accumulate things and possessions over time. Every other animal, with a few exceptions, tends to just abandon things. And they certainly don't have the emotional attachment or the sentimental attachment to objects. Uh, with one exception, and I'll just tell you now that domesticated dogs are one exception to the rule. They do form emotional attachments to things. Um, but if you wanna know more about that, you need to read the book. But in general, as a species, we are unique in the sense that not only do we have technologies, but other animals also have technologies, but we have concepts of ownership. See, animals have concepts of possession, which is if you've got it, you can fight for it. But ownership is a convention. Ownership is a recognition that if somebody owns something, they own that in perpetuity, even when the person isn't present. And so theft can occur when the owner isn't present. So that's why ownership is a concept which differs from possession. So we've been making things uh, for hundreds of thousands of years, some of the earliest weapons, uh, arrows date to around about 200,000 years BC, but artifacts which were coveted because of their aesthetic values, they started to appear in the fossil record around about 100,000 years ago. These are some of the earliest examples. Uh, this is jewelry made from seashells. Uh, this is a piece of ochre carved um, with some geometric lines. Nobody knows exactly what it was made for. It wasn't a tool. Um, by the way, these come from the, uh, the Blomberg Caves in South Africa. And these are really early, but it was, I think, around about the, the more upper Paleolithic period, which is about 30 to 40,000 years ago. Suddenly there's an explosion in the fossil record. 
and you're finding all sorts of artifacts. And clearly these were owned and valued and revered. Um, these are Venus figurines. Uh, we assume they had some fertility role, uh, some fertility purpose. But the point is that many of these things were found in graves, uh, presumably in the belief that there was an afterlife and these were the possessions and therefore they could be taken into the next life. Now, during this period of early um, pre-modern humans, I suppose you could consider ourselves as hunter-gatherers. So we didn't really individually have a lot of things because there's a real problem if you're a hunter-gatherer accumulating things. But that all changed in the last sort of 15,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture. Now, this uh, marks a transition in our evolution from being sort of migratory, transitory hunter-gatherers to settling down to domesticate the crops, uh, to start to domesticate the animals, and to accumulate wealth. And uh, now you have the formation of much more formalized societies. I mean, there were societies in hunter-gatherers or hierarchies, but in the civilizations, and this is the only slide I could find which sort of captures this. This is Egyptian, which is not exactly 15,000 years ago. But the, my point is, is that when these early civilizations started to form, then people started to recognize the laws of ownership because now there was territory. Uh, if you went off to fight a battle, you expected to come back to your land. Uh, there were laws of inheritance. Things could be passed on. So now ownership starts to become a central component to, if you like, the glue of civilizations. But in terms of possessions, we still didn't actually have a lot. Now, I try to find some images to capture the sort of typical uh, household itinerary of an early family, and I couldn't find any slides. This is the earliest I could get. This is, a, um, this is from the 1400s in Poland, I believe. Uh, I suppose it's a me medieval family. Now, if you think back to that photograph I showed you early on of the Midwestern family, um, you can see that they have a lot less in terms of you know, items and for obvious reasons. They don't have the technology or the manufacturing, and they're, they're much more functional. Most people, unless they were incredibly wealthy, were living off land, subsistence uh, living. Uh, we had feudal systems all the way up uh, into the 15th, 16th century. So, you know, basically people were living on subsistence. They were kind of living in smaller communities. Uh, they were sharing their resources. The towns and the cities existed, but they, they weren't as densely packed or populated. That, of course, all changed in the 17th century with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. And now, of course, what we have is a completely transitory experience because previously, you know, people were spending their hours working all the time. One man would be spending all day weaving one bulb of wool, but the invention of the spinning jenny meant that he can now make maybe 24 to go. And then of course you, you put it onto a water mill or you attach it to a steam engine. Suddenly you have machinery which exponentially increases the productivity. So you have the emergence of uh, factories and this has required the workers. So the workers migrated out of the countrysides to start to populate the town. So they were no longer uh, making their own subsistence living. They were given uh, wages and they had salaries. They had disposable incomes and they were living cheek by jowl in housing. Okay, very different to the, the lifestyle living on the country. And so the reason this is relevant is because this disposable income became the basis for capitalism. And capitalism was really this political drive to generate economic growth by uh, obviously sales. This is something that we're all familiar with. We've been living in a capitalist society now for hundreds of years. And during this period, there was an exponential increase in productivity. Production uh, values were soaring through the roofs. Uh, for example, uh, the population of America between 1860 and 1920 uh, only tripled in size, but the productivity due to mechanization increased by a rate of about 14, uh, 14 fold. So these factories were generating more and more things and the mechanization meant that they needed less labor, but they didn't reduce the labor hours or reduce the workforces. What they did is they increased salaries and this was a drive to stimulate consumption. So the whole machinery of economic growth was this balance between consumerism, capitalism, and, and this kind of need to be spending and seen to be um, you know, successful. As uh, epitomized by this picture, uh, this is Tintisfield House, by the way, in Bristol. Uh, 
This is a picture taken during the mid uh, Victorian era. Now, this was obviously a mansion. This is people of incredible wealth, but it wasn't, um, un, it wasn't unfamiliar to find other middle class families spending a lot of money buying things. And moreover, fashion started to shape the attitudes. People wanted to have the latest things. They wanted to be seen to be successful. And so these, these, uh, these drawing rooms, as they were called, were often just display cabinets to demonstrate how wealthy you are because wealth was equated with status. Now, this was something that um, Adam Smith, I suppose the founder of modern economics, had recognized in this quote. He says, the rich man glories in his riches because he feels that they naturally draw upon him the attention of the world. In contrast, the poor man is ashamed of his poverty. He feels that it places him out of sight of mankind. And I think that this actually is, you know, it foretells, uh, you know, our obsessions today. I think social media is, has amplified this anxiety and concern that is deeply rooted in our psychology, which is the need to be seen to be successful, to be signaling to others how, how, how wealthy we are, how, how much we've achieved. Now, in the book, I go into great length explaining where that comes from. And I think there's good arguments. You can trace this to um, what's called peacocking or signaling theory, which comes from evolutionary theory. Uh, just for a slight detour, it was kind of interesting that when Darwin was uh, developing his theory of natural selection, just to, to uh, paraphrase, you know, selection or natural selection occurs, uh, variation occurs as, as an adaptation to the environment. Um, when he thought about the peacock tail, he wrote it made him physically sick. And the reason it made him physically sick was it, it ran totally counter to the theory of natural selection because it's such a ludicrous adaptation. Uh, these tails make the birds flightless. Um, they're basically the metabolism to keep them going is really very expensive. Why would birds develop such elaborate displays? Well, he got his insight when he figured out another component of, of selection, which is not natural selection, but sexual selection. Not only is there competition with the environment, but there's competition within the species because basically the imbalance between females to males. Males can produce many offspring, but females can only produce one egg. And so they have to be selective about who they mate with. And therefore the males are competing for the, the affections of the female in order to have their offspring, their progeny. And this is why when you look around the natural kingdom, the most colorful birds, the ones with the most ostentatious displays or the horns or all the adaptations, um, uh, armaments or ornaments as Darwin called them, they're males, okay? And uh, those of you who remember or have watched the great David Narborough uh, documentaries, uh, he's always pointing out these incredibly bizarre displays. And this is what's called signaling theory. And we're no different. We are another animal where we're different. Of course, we have technologies. We haven't evolved tails, but we have evolved physical features. But with our technology, of course, we can now signal our prowess with our possessions. And so this is what we call conspicuous consumption. Uh, Torsten Nedlin on the end there uh, coined this term, and he was basically pointing out this is the reason people would rather spend good money uh, on a silver spoon rather than spending less money on an equally functional lead spoon, to quote his original example, because of this need to be seen to be successful. Okay, so I think this is a, um, a modern uh, marketing uh, strategy, which has hijacked a much older uh, evolutionary mechanism. That's what I would argue. Then there's another couple of um, characters in the rogues gallery of consumerism. We have Eddie Bernays, uh, one of the first originators of marketing, and he realized the power of crowds and advertising. You see, prior to the, you know, the late 19th and early 20th century, if you were buying things, you were just, you were just basically told, oh, the, uh, the function of something, okay? But as fashion started to shape attitudes, what uh, marketeers recognize is the power of crowds, the power to be wanting to be a member of it. And this is how they use this feeling of inadequacy to try and generate or stimulate the desire to spend more and be more. And of course, um, John Watson, uh, a psychologist, he originated the celebrity endorsement. So he was one of the instigators of these advertising campaigns where they would deliberately pair or associate famous people with products because people wanted to be like their 
uh, heroes. And to do so, they could buy a bit of that by simply buying the next thing. All this, all of these strategies were to stimulate and maintain the economic drive because they had to keep selling more and more to sustain the, the growth. And, you know, I, 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 this is a quote from a, one of my favorite films called Fight Club. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but uh, it, it sort of epitomizes what I think is a kind of truism to some extent. We buy things we don't necessarily need with money we don't have because we're buying everything on credit, very often to impress people we don't necessarily like. And again, I come back to social media because I think the new generation are very vulnerable to this because of this. And I, I, I work with a lot of kids. I, I see how much time they're spending on social media, how unhappy they feel, how un inadequate they feel. And I think, again, social media is hijacking these uh, much older mechanisms which need us to become, which we feel, that, which make us inadequate because we're such social animals we want to be included. So let's go back to this relationship between why we buy stuff. Okay, one is to be uh, recognized, but two, a second aspect of, of our consumption is really to establish our identity, our sense of self. Now, I wrote a book called The self Illusion, as I mentioned right at the beginning, and um, I'll come back to this point uh, now because in many ways, the self is a, is a, it's a constructed, it's a construction, okay? There is no integrated self, I would argue. Maybe I'll come back and give another talk on that. But the sense of self is something which is the accumulation of a variety of things that we call us. And that includes our possessions. And this is captured again by William James, one of my favorite philosophers and psychologists. And to quote, he says, a, self, a man's self is the sum of what he can call his own. Not only his body and his psychic powers, but his clothes, his house, his wife and his children, his ancestors and friends, his reputation and works, his lands, horses, yacht and bank account. Okay, it's slightly misogynist, but he's basically capturing this point that a person of substance is a person of wealth, is a person of personal possessions. And so this is this notion that who we are is an extension of our, our what's mine, what's yours, and what is shared. Okay, these are the basic parameters of ownership. OK, this is mine. If it's mine, I can do with it as I wish. If that's yours, then I'm not supposed to touch it because it's yours. And if it's ours, then we need to come up with some mutual arrangement. And just about everything, if you think about it, in our modern lives fits into some sort of parameter like that. That's your space. This is my space. This is your shopping trolley. That's and so on and so forth. Now, this seems self-evident. It seems obvious that you know, ownership shouldn't be something to be quibbled about. But in fact, ownership is a lot more, as I said, right at the very beginning, I'm fascinated by these things which seem obvious, but when you start to consider are actually a little bit more uh, obscure than you normally think. And to make that point, I'm going to tell you uh, a tale, a modern tale, which is quite astounding. For example, do you own your own body? Now, I'm sure we could do a poll now. I, I won't do it just yet, Andreas, but just for the moment, I'm sure most of you, if I was to ask you that and you say to yourself, do you own your own body? Most people say, of course you own your own body. If, you own, if there's one thing you own, you come into this world, it's your body, but not necessarily. And I'm going to tell you the tale of Shannon Wishant here. Now, Shannon Wishant was a trader, um, and I can't remember, it was back in 2007 in North Carolina in a small little uh, town. And he used to make a living by going around and buying up secondhand items. And on this particular occasion, uh, he went to a sale which was being run by a, a, a storage lockup company who was selling off the contents of lockups where people had reneged on their payments. OK, so they failed to keep up with their, their rents. And he bought himself this smoker grill for, I think, five dollars, which he thought was a, a bargain. But imagine his surprise when he got at home. And he opened it up and he discovered this inside, a left human foot. He'd gotten more than he bargained for. Okay, this was a mummified foot. And this grotesque, bizarre story is captured in a fascinating documentary. I think it might still be on Netflix called Finders Keepers. And they've even got a recording, the 911 call. You know, they make the calls to the police there. And I'll do this terrible Appalachian accent. He's got this hillbilly accent. He says, I got myself a left human foot. It's gross, ugly, and I'm... I need to get rid of it. So the police got this call from this guy saying they just found a human foot 
and they didn't know what was going on here. Was this an unreported murder? Was maybe somebody dismembering or digging up corpses? What's going on here? So they, they came and they took the food away to begin their investigations. Meanwhile, news had got out that Shannon, who was a bit of a local character, had bought this human foot and people said, I want to see it. And Shannon being a bit of an entrepreneur thought, you know what, maybe I can make some money. I could maybe uh, like a freak show, I could take the foot out and I could charge people a couple of bucks and uh, I could make some money. So he had some t-shirts printed up and some baseball caps. And he called the police back. He said, uh, now this is Shannon Wishing here again. Um, I want my foot back, okay? I've got a bill of sale. I own that cooker and all the contents therein. Therefore, I want my foot back. Meanwhile, um, the police had begun their investigations and it turned out that the foot didn't come from someone deceased. It came from somebody who was still alive. And here we have this guy, John. Now, John, actually, uh, this is an interesting tale. He had been in a air crane uh, crash um, several years earlier, about 2005. Uh, his father was wealthy, they had their own private plane. John was piloting the plane. And when um, he, they hit a mountain, his father was killed outright and John was severely injured, but he had his foot uh, amputated. John Wood is his name, by the way. And um, for reasons which are not entirely clear, clear to me, John Wood asked the hospital to have his foot back. They had to amputate his leg. He said, I wanted to keep it. And the hospital, believe it or not, gave John Wood his foot back. So John returned to his house and then he went about then mummifying his leg. He thought in his mind that he was responsible for the air crash. And so he wanted to keep some memorial for his father. It really does sound a bit crazy, but there again, John Wood was a bit crazy anyway. He had a drink and drugs problem. And soon his life was spiraling out of control. So he lost his job. He was an amputee, he was on disabilities. Uh, he put all the contents of his house into a locker storage, and then he moved to South Carolina. And that's how the foot and the grill ended up in the possession of, of, John Wish uh, of uh, Shannon Wishart. So they called him up and they said, is that Mr. John Wood? Um, did you lose a leg? Um, and he said, yeah. And they said, okay, would you mind collecting? So the documentary at this point crew had gotten this story was a major story in the u.s uh they were following this this whole thing unfolding and this is a picture captured in a car park where shannon is confronting john wish and they're arguing about who owns the foot and uh shannon was trying to get john to agree to joint custody of the foot so that he could have it for two weeks and then john could have it for two weeks okay so i think i am going to do um uh, a poll in a moment so get ready to answer this poll it turned out they couldn't re uh, uh, reach an agreement on it so they had to take it to court and uh they had to argue about who was the legal owner of the foot so um andreas uh, let's see if this is going to work oops i seem to have, oh there we go there we go i think my computers are overheating but hopefully it wouldn't have died on me Oh, that'll be a shame if it's died. Just give me one moment, everybody. Don't lose. It's an interesting story. Okay. All right. Here's the poll. I want you to put on chat now. Who is the owner of the foot? John Wood, the amputee, or Shannon Wishart, who bought it? And Andreas, we'll give them a moment to see if anyone is still awake <laughs> and if anyone has a strong opinion on that. And if you could just give me a sense. Yes. And uh, Bruce, I'm also going to put, I've got a poll facility on Zoom. So I'm going to launch it as a poll as well. Oh, can you? Oh, that's fantastic. I don't know if you could. All right. I think you have to set that up in advance, but all right. Yeah. It doesn't matter. So I've done that already. So if people want to vote, they can go to polls. The people are voting now, Okay. which is great. And uh, I shall give you all about another sort of 10, 15 seconds. And uh, we'll then have the conclusion. Yes, we've got uh, we've got 22 replies so far already. So I'll give people literally another sort of minute or so, and then we reveal the result. Right. Okay. I think most people who were going to do the poll have done it, and uh, there's also some stuff coming in on uh, on the chat.
So I'll close the poll on uh, on the Zoom, and uh, it is the results are as follows. So let me just uh, share that. So 42% believe that the person who lost the foot owns the foot, and 58% believe that uh, the person who bought the foot should be the rightful owner. Okay. Are you back again, uh, Bruce? We seem to have lost Bruce. I hope he's going to be dialing back in. But that's interesting. I'll also uh, make sure we can actually have a look at the chat while we're waiting for, for Bruce to make a reappearance. There's me. Uh, let me just go through the, the things. Um, right. Here we go. I think it should be A, but uh, but I bet a court picked B. That was from Anna. Uh, we've got Rog. Don't have a strong opinion. It's such a hypothetical idea. And who else have we got? We've got Chrissy. Read the foot. I can't decide. Well, there you go. This, so we've got quite a, and then we've got somebody from Sharon let me have a look at that one as well that surprises me a is right surely someone stole his computer and he's chasing after them from Paul Bain and uh, Colin is mentioning my left foot which obviously is a film so that's good uh, I haven't I haven't seen I don't know what happened to Bruce which is a bit of a worry uh, but we'll keep on going Maybe you want to unmute yourselves in the meantime and we can have a discussion around personal ownership uh, but until uh, Bruce, ah, Bruce is back again. Let me just uh, let Bruce in and then we can continue. But it's quite interesting, even in the chat room, people seem to suggest mainly that uh, it should be the people who, uh, who lost the foot. Hello, Bruce. I, 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 my computer just died on me. I don't know what the hell happened there. I'm really sorry about that, but I'm still here and I can still finish the talk if you'd, li if you'd like me to. No, no, of course. I, I, we, we've, we've kept on going whilst you were going back in. It's quite interesting. We seem to have uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the poll, we seem to have 42% yeah. agree with the fact that the person who lost the foot should own it. But 58% actually agree that it should be the person who bought it. Uh, which is actually which is actually quite different to what happened in the chat room. I think the, uh, <laughs> you know it's it's quite interesting that uh, there's clearly a big discussion around uh, moral and legal issues here, because obviously whether a contract is a legal uh, ownership, but actually you know the poor guy who lost the foot uh, should be the rightful owner, uh, as far as some other people are concerned. So it's roughly even, but I think most people, the majority, still think whoever bought the foot owns the foot. Over to you, Bruce. Well, uh, well, it turns out that the judge adjudicated that the foot should be returned to John Wood, okay, but that Shannon had to be compensated to the extent of uh, $5,000. So they recognized his legal ownership, but it was, it was just one of these decisions which were not clear cut. And I think that's the point about ownership. That's one of the reasons we have lawyers is that um, ownership, when you start to drill down into it, becomes a much more contentious issue, uh, such as who has prior, um, uh, you know, uh, priority over things. So what I'm going to do now, because I'm actually in my kitchen now, I'm going to find my, uh, I'm going to find the talk, which was previously on iCloud. Okay, so just bear with me a moment. And then I'm going to finish the talk using the conventional Zoom format because literally my computer just keeled over and died. I think it was just overwhelmed by the, the intensity of the talk. Here we go. I'm going to just find this one. So I'm launching the talk again remotely on my laptop this time. So this is real flexible multitasking here. I hope you appreciate. Um, and let's see what we got. Okay, that's the wrong talk. Let's get this one up and going. And we have, 
And I do, I do apologize profusely, but thank you for bearing with me. Let's get this going. Uh, right. I need to... I've enabled you to share the screen, Bruce. So whenever you yeah, that's what that's what we're going to have to do, actually. Yeah. Okay. So I've got the glass. All right, that's better. Okay. So where are we now? So, okay, that looks good. And I'm going to play that. Okay. And so I uh, share screen. Yeah. I would go like that. Okay. And then I go into play mode. Um, oops, today's I can't see anything. Oh, there we go. Right, that should be better again. Okay, good. Yeah, we can all see that. So you're good to go. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I think the point about the uh, Shannon Wishing case is this is a case where it's not cut and dried, unlike the foot. Uh, ownership is a concept, and this is something that Jeremy Bentham, who ironically is cut and dried, this is the uh, this is the corpse of uh, the mummified corpse of Jeremy Bentham, which is sitting in UCL at the moment, I believe. And um, he pointed out that the problem with these concepts is that they have to be derived, all right? There's nothing in nature to tell you who owns what. And it's a metaphysical thing. There's nothing in the writing to tell you who owns anything. And so as a developmental psychologist, this is one of the things which fascinate me. How do children learn the concepts of ownership? I mean, do we teach them explicitly? Well, to some extent, we teach them about sharing, but largely and this is a truism of a lot of developmental psychology is that children discover a lot of things by themselves so for example they kind of know this uh aspect about holding on to their possessions a lot of them have attachment objects within the first couple of years of life uh they fight with their siblings over things over 90 percent of conflicts in the playground are over possession and what's really interesting in the playground behavior is that very often this is because children recognize that having control of something gives them some status. You know, very often children will fight over toys and having won it, they'll abandon it and go after another kid's toy. So they're, they're kind of trying to establish the hierarchy, the pecking order, and possessions are seen as a way of, of doing that. So initially, there are concepts of ownership are who's in possession of something. And with time, around, actually quite early on, around about second or third birthday, they recognize that uh, when somebody owns something, it's incumbent on them to protect that right. So if the person uh, turns their back and someone steals it, the child recognizes that that is a violation of ownership and they'll defend and intervene in those sorts of situations. But then they have some strange notions of what, uh, what constitutes ownership. Um, they have a basic understanding that if something is made, it's likely to be owned. Uh, so in these studies, for example, <clears throat> if they're told about walking across a park and they're asked, you know, does anyone own the pine cone? They say no. But if, if there's a ring found, then, you know, a four or five year old will uh, re understand that this is probably a possession that's been lost. Now, of course, we assume that all natural things are unowned as well, but that's not entirely true. Some national parks, for example, you can't remove stones. So it depends on what your knowledge is of the situation. But then they do have some peculiar ideas about ownership up until this is five, six years of age. They think, for example, that if the owner is unconscious or in a coma or is tied up, then they're not the owner. And the reason we think this is the case is because they're still relying on this sort of naive assumption that if you can control an object in your possession, then you're the legitimate owner. But if you can't control it, then you can't own it. Uh, now, of course, that's not something that, that we would agree with as adults. One of the more interesting phenomena that I wanted to bring to your attention is, of ownership is, is the so-called endowment effect. Now, this is probably one of the most studied behavioral phenomena in behavioral economics, uh, discovered jointly by uh, Nobel Prize winners uh, Richard Thaler and Donny Kahneman. Kahneman, you may have heard about before. He's the thinking fast, thinking slow sort of guy. Now, this endowment effect is this bias to overvalue your own um, products, your own possessions. So, for example... Uh, if you ask people about two coffee cups, they say, oh, yeah, they're of equal value. But as soon as one comes into possession, then people value their coffee cup as being more. And there are, there are literally hundreds of studies looking at it. And what's fascinating about the endowment effect is it's not entirely um, universal. It, it's found pretty much across the planet, but the strength of it varies depending on the culture that you're in. So, for example, the endowment effect is less pronounced in some Eastern cultures. Uh, 
but there's a classic study where you can get people who are Hong Kongers who see themselves as both um, inhabiting Eastern and Western values. You can prime them to think uh, as Easterners and the endowment effect goes down. But as soon as you prime them to think about being Westerners, the endowment effect goes up. And just to remind you, the endowment effect is a bias to overvalue your own uh, possessions. Um, and we've been studying this in children because normally it's not found in children until around about six years of age. But we discovered you can induce it in actually three-year-olds with a simple paradigm. So I don't know if you can make the slide out here, but here we have, this is Sandra. She's from Norway, by the way. She's my graduate student, or was, she's now qualified. Um, in this study, this is with three-year-olds, we got them to put values on various sorts of things. Now, some of these things were desirable toys and some of them were sort of bits of rubbish. And they put it on a sort of scale of smiley faces. The big face means they liked it more and the upset face means they didn't like it. Because children at three don't understand the concept of money. You can't get them to put a price on something, but they can show you the relative worth of things. And critically, what we did was we gave them two identical spinning tops, okay? And we asked them to put them on the scale and most children put them on the same face. In other words, they understood the principle of equivalence, okay? Having done that, we then gave them one of the spinning tops and said, uh, this is yours, Julie, and this is Sandra said, this is mine. And then we did the induction where we got them to think about either themselves, uh, a good friend, or a neutral scene. The way we did this is we said, okay, make a picture of yourself and tell me about what you like. Or the children in the group talk about their friends, said, so make a picture of your friend, tell us about your friend, tell us what they like. And then the third group just had to do a country scene of a farm, animals, and so on. Then the really important point, the test was, we brought the objects back in again, and we asked them to put a value on them. And what we found was that the children who had been thinking about themselves and talking about themselves, they valued their spinning top as more valuable than the other person's spinning top. OK, and we didn't find that effect in the other groups. So this suggests that, like I mentioned earlier on, that our possessions are extensions of ourself. And when we're really self-centered and thinking about our things, then we tend to overvalue them. And that's why it's less pronounced in cultures where that sense of self isn't so individualistic. And this is why you don't find it in hunter-gatherer tribes. The, there's very little endowment effect in the individuals. And one of the reasons is, is they don't have a lot of personal possessions. In fact, they have a principle of sharing called demand sharing that if you're not using it, then I'm entitled to help myself to it because hunter gatherers can't carry lots of individual things. It's just inconsistent with their lifestyles. Now, hunter gatherers are fast disappearing off the planet and I'm pretty sure that they're now exposed to many Western moderns. But my point is it's not entirely in our DNA, if you like. I think this is a, a behavior which reflects our sense of um, uh, individualism as opposed to our sense of uh, group membership. So this brings me to the final slides. And this is uh, Csikszentmihalyi. This is a psychologist, you may not recognize the name, but he's the psychologist behind the concept of flow. He's a really brilliant thinker. And I, I particularly like this quote from him where he's really summing up again what Adam Smith had said earlier on. And I think it brings this together that, you know, there is this uh, relationship we have with our stuff and our sense of achievement. And he says, a, good, a person who owns a nice home, a new car, good furniture, the latest appliances is recognized by others as having passed the test of personhood in our society. The objects we possess and consume are one because they tell us things about ourselves that we need to hear in order to keep ourselves from falling apart. In other words, it provides us with a roadmap. It provides us with a set of uh, barometers by which we can judge whether or not we're achieving what's expected of us. But very often you get to the end of your life and you realize that maybe you've been spending far too much time in the pursuit of these material things. So hopefully as we come to the end of this talk, um, we can recognize that overconsumption is problematic uh, for our planet. Uh, this is the famous uh, Planet Blue uh, 2 uh, documentary where Richard Attenborough was pointing out the problems of overconsumption and plastic being symptomatic of that. But I'd like us to sort of leave tonight that at least... What, I don't want anyone to be as on their deathbed and they say, I just wish I bought more crap, okay? So I'll leave that there and uh, I'll take some questions now. And I, I apologize for the lighting and uh, the, the lack of uh, the break in the middle there. But thankfully, um, hopefully some of you stayed on. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. That's, uh, that was a fascinating talk. I'm, I'm reminded of the, 
the American T-shirt that I saw, which had the words, he who dies with most toys wins. Yes. And, um, <laughs> but certainly I'm That's thinking good. myself, it's time I decluttered a bit. But uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I look forward to hearing the questions. And I'd like to hand over to Andreas, who, who will share those. Hello, yes. Uh... I just want to echo uh, Don's uh, comments, uh, Bruce. Excellent presentation, really, really interesting, uh, especially around the the difference between wants and needs. And uh, uh, we've have got some questions in in the chat room, which we can get to. Uh, but it would be useful if uh, everybody who wants to unmute themselves and show their show their uh, video can do so now, and uh, you can raise questions by simply raising your hand and I can pick you out. Alternatively, you can press the button of raise your hand in Zoom or alternatively put some more questions in, in the chat room. So is there anybody who wants to actually, before we go into the chat room, it's always nice to do this face to face as best we can on Zoom. Uh, is anybody got a question currently uh, in the audience before we go to the chat room? Penelope, you, you, and, and, oh, and there's Elizabeth. Betty, do you have a question? Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask him if he had uh, tried to correlate happiness and possessions. That's a very interesting question. <clears throat> and it's actually, uh, there's a whole field of positive psychology where this issue has been revisited a number of times. And economists are particularly interested in this. Now, to be to cut to the chase, the, the issue is contentious. And it depends who you ask, of course. Um, at the micro level, most people believe that there is a positive relationship between wealth and happiness, and that is true. However, that is only true up to a certain point, because once you reach a certain level of wealth, then there's no additional benefit for accumulated um, uh, wealth in terms of increased happiness. It, it seems to level off. Now, <clears throat> there are people who criticize that, um, but there's no argument about um, people who are in the poverty range. They are de definitely not as happy, okay? And it really comes down to control because a lot of the misery is the fact that they can't, they've lost control over their lives. Now, at the macro level, there is arguments about raising the GDP of a country and its relationship to, to uh, happiness. And uh, Richard Easterlin, a very famous economist, has uh, described what he calls the Easterlin paradox, which is that once countries start to rise in their, um, their GDP, then their levels of happiness again just flatten off. <clears throat> so I suppose the, best, the, the shorter answer to that rambling you know, response is that there is a relationship, but that relationship only holds up to a certain point after which it doesn't seem to hold anymore. And that seems to make a lot of intu intuitive sense to myself, especially if that additional wealth comes at the cost of personal effort and uh, consolations or conciliations, giving up your time and freedom. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank Andres, you for that. Can, I, can, I, can I ask that, that one's the correlation of wealth, but how about yeah. possessions? Because you could be somebody who was very wealthy, but you were giving it uh, to charity and had very few possessions. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't have that data because no one has really looked. I mean, there's a general relationship between wealth and, and possessions, but you're right. It's not a, a necessary relationship. As, as far as I'm aware, um, nobody has looked at that. I suppose because no, people have just been considering wealth. It's a very easy variable to get a, a number on, whereas possessions is something which is much more difficult to, to estimate. I would have thought that might be one of the reasons no one's looked at it. But uh, I think you're right. And I, 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 you know, I certainly don't want to paint everyone the same. Um, people can have incredible wealth in giving it away. And, uh, you know, I, I think of people like Bill Gates and a lot of people who have promised to give away the majority of their wealth. So, I, I mean, that's a whole other set of issues there. Um, but I think that, you know, we worry about the planet. We worry what we can do. And we're looking for technologies to change things. But I think all of us as consumers can reassess the extent to which we need to buy things that we don't really need. Yeah. And, and often just ask that question, why do we do that? Yeah, and, yeah. and to, absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. And also to you, Betty, you might be interested in looking up effective altruism by Peter Singer, who actually explores oh. the whole idea of altruism and, and, and uh, uh, its behavior. So that's helpful. Anybody else wants to ask a question in the on on here before we go to the chat room okay uh, i'll go to the chat room for the next question there's a question here about 
to, uh, what is the balance between nature and nurture in terms of wants and needs? And I think the way That's you described that earlier, Bruce, was that you seem to be suggesting it's, it's much more nurture than nature. But uh, maybe I was misinterpreting that. Well, I mean, this is the this is the question every uh, behavioral psychologist, behavioral scientist gets often. What is the nature? What's the nurture? Um, and I always have to do I always have to do a little bit of um, clarification about that. It's a, a false dichotomy. Uh, there's always both. Um, it's how they interact, which is of interest. But just to give you some um, some examples, so you can get a sense of this, we know that, for example, um, happiness is has got about a forty percent inheritability rate, and intelligence is round about the same. So these are two things that people often talk about: is you know personality and intelligence. Are they are they nurture? Are they genetic? Or are they are they learned? And I would suggest that looking at the relationship between happiness and possessions and, and so on is probably going to be in a similar boundary because I feel that satisfactions and, and perceptions of achievement are very much tied to our sense of happiness. But this issue of nature and nurture fails to um, convey, I think, because it's always set up as an either or thing, that there's going to be a lot of individual variation, okay? And what you see when you hear about 50% for intelligence and 40% for happiness, that's the, the average. Um, that's the average variance. And unfortunately, that's the only thing that behavioral geneticists can talk about. They can never talk about anything at an individual level, unless it's something with an identifiable gene, uh, such as, you know, what, one of the recognized uh, deformity of genes. But things which are multi a multi gene um, phenomena like intelligence there's no single gene for that and there's no single gene for happiness unfortunately all we can do is just average across populations and work out roughly what that correlation is and it's generally never more than about 50 percent for anything really interesting okay so <laughs> I, I there's a there's a there's an old joke that um when you ask a professor whether his children are smart uh, whether it's nature or nurture they always say nature and when they say, are your students smart? They always say nurture. So I think that just reflects this kind of <laughs> dichotomy of thinking. Yeah, very good. And I've got another question here. Uh, oh, Paul, go, go on, Paul. You go, go first. Oh, hi, Paul. Paul. Oh, hi. Hi, thanks, Bruce. I, I was thinking about this and um, thinking that actually possessions fall into different categories, which you touched on on the talk. So mm. when I look around me, I mean, some of the possessions I have have sentimental value because they oh, remind yeah. me of memories or people I know. Um, there's others that I have which are functional. And yeah. there's, a, there's a whole raft of them which yeah. I ought to throw away, but which I kind of hang on to because they might come in useful. And, <laughs> uh, and I just wondered, have you got any analysis of how that breaks down? Uh, well, you know, Paul, this is actually how I got into this whole field, um, because I was fascinated by sentimental attachment. Um, some of my earlier work from about 15 years ago was uh, blankets and teddy bears. And the reason I did that was because my eldest daughter developed an emotional attachment to a, to a blanket, which just struck me as bizarre. I, I didn't know about it as a parent at, at the time. And uh, I, by the way, she's in her mid-20s and she's still got the damn blanket, whereas my <laughs> other daughter didn't. And I couldn't figure out for me, why is it some children form an emotional attachment to a thing and others don't? And there's a very interesting story there. It turns out that there's uh, some early experiences uh, which might explain that. I think there are personality differences as well. But you've highlighted a really important point. And I saw, I just briefly touched upon it. I do more in the book, but sentimental attachment is a particular form of ownership which um, satisfies a deep emotional need. OK, and it taps into some very deep philosophical concepts about authenticity. Uh, for example, this is why we value an original piece of work more than an identical duplicate, even though you, you could have two works by Gauguin. Uh, oh, sorry about oh, that. <laughs> sorry. If you, you could have two um, pieces of uh, you could have an original and uh, an identical duplicate. And we value the original because we imbue with it the essence of the artist. Whereas even though the other one is indistinguishable down to the atomic level, it's not worth as much. So what we're doing with sentimental values is we're satisfying a deep emotional connection with the previous owner or the concept that we're trying to connect with. And that's why memorabilia, uh, typically people collect that because it, it aligns with a period in their time when they were happy okay so that's why all the rock and roll memorabilia is starting to appear because most of us have reached an age where that was a formative part of our years so there are those sorts of things which are uh, satisfying that aspect of self-identity 
Interestingly enough, uh, people who are more psychotic, who are less emotionally um, uh, attached as you are, tend not to form those attachments to those sorts of things. They can dispose of things. So I think you'll find that what people form attachments to is often a reflection of their personality in general, which is kind of interesting. And as to not giving, give, giving things away, most of, us have that, most of us have that to some extent, but of course that can become pathological. And that's then when you're into hoarding behavior. And hoarding is just the extreme end of a normal continuum of this endowment effect. If you like, it's the over, over evaluation of things, the fact that it might be useful. And so the fear of losing it outweighs the fear of retaining it. But yeah, it's, it's something um, which I think uh, we can shape with cultural values. I think we're seeing it already happening with recycling. I think we're seeing an, a, changing, a change in the market uh a much more conscientious buying and I, I think it's a good thing yeah good thank you bruce i think uh, the attachment to, uh, to, for comfort like the blanket i think it's got an official name now i think it's called a nunu <laughs> so you can uh, tell you uh, can tell your daughter she's she's still got her nunu uh, well, she calls it Ning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right. We've got somebody else. Uh, th I've, this person will remain anonymous, but uh, it says here, do you have any advice for a self-confessed hoarder? Shallow as I am, I love having stuff. Yeah. Well, I think, look, I'm not here to uh, cast judgment upon anything. It's, uh, as I said, it's the relentless pursuit at the cost of personal liberty and health is when you should really be looking carefully. That's when you're into an addiction type of thing. Now, um, for many people, hoarding can is, is manageable. For some, it, but it does actually. And, and, you know, there are these terrible uh, gawkish uh, TV programs where we can all kind of gawk at people who have become incapacitated, and that clearly is a psych. Uh, that's a psychopathology. That's a that's a situation where they really are living in life threatening uh, conditions, um, and that's really down to um, dysfunctional obsessive compulsive disorder of the frontal lobes. Uh, we know it's a clinically relevant condition, so they respond to treatments which target that. But it's actually one of the most difficult things to treat. If you're a real compulsive uh, personality, obsessive compulsive hoarder, it's one of the most difficult conditions to treat. So I'm just hoping you're someone with a slight inclination to keeping more things, but um, it is a recognized condition. So if you're actually on that situation where you, you, you can't move around your home because it's literally cluttered, then that's maybe something it's time to sort of try and do something about. Um, but I, I can't cast a judgment on that. Hmm. Okay. I've got a comment here from Rog, uh, Rog, who agrees with Bruce that dogs have a sense of ownership because his dog keeps, doesn't stop eating so until he births. So obviously he feels very precious about his food, so it doesn't need it. And then we've got Paul Bain, who talks about Tim Kasser has work on materialism, at least desire for possessions and well-being. And uh, he quotes, materialistic people reported lower life satisfaction and self-actualization yep. than non-materialistic people. That's true. So I teach a course at Bristol called The Science of Happiness, and we have a whole um, lecture on materialism. I bring in some of this stuff, but um, there's, a, there's a number of studies showing that people who spend their money on material things show a faster adaptation to it, whereas experiences generate lo longer lasting things. Now, we have to be slightly careful because it depends on what sort of person you are. It turns out personality determines that. Um, but the thing about material things is that we adapt to them very quickly. What seems to be driving a lot of this consumer behavior, and I didn't get time to go into it, is it's not the acquisition of things, it's the pursuit of things. Mm -hmm. And that is tapping into a lot of the reward systems in the brain so that we get a real thrill at the prospect of acquiring things, which is why auctions are so uh, emotional because you you know uh, you can feel yourself getting caught up by it all. Um, they talk about sh shopping being a therapy sometimes. Again, for for compulsive shoppers, um, you, you get people who who go shopping all the time and they just have lots of unopened things in their closets because it's not the acquisition, it's the pursuit. So it's I think that's probably a very powerful driver uh, mm. behind a lot of these things. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. I think this is turning into confessional. I've got somebody else here who will remain anonymous. I am 49 and have, I and I have my blanket. It lives in a little box and I rarely do anything with it. But it would be the one thing I would save in the fire and it goes on holiday with me. So there you go. So it's obviously quite a strong urge here. 
for these kinds um, of things? Actually, my first, my first book called Super Sense, which was uh, a book about the um, natural origins of supernatural beliefs, I, um, I talked about the blanket phenomena and uh, I was contacted by a reader. Uh, actually, it was someone I'd, I blogged about it. So they contacted me, they ended up in the book and his mother was 85 and she right. still had her, her blanket. And the one time she was in the Blitz in London and uh, she, was, she would have been a teenager at the time or a young child. She had to be physically restrained from going back into the, the house, which was on fire because she was worried about her blanket. So I, I totally understand this thing. And by the way, she was buried with it. So the, right. these things are uh, very common, um, but I think they manifest in collecting behavior as well, because we know yeah. there's a link between sentimental attachment and people who also start to um, form or value authentic objects. Right. No, thank you. There's another comment from Paul. Richens and colleagues work on materialism distinguish three components as an indicator of success. Centrality, priority given to material goods over other things, and happiness, joy gained from uh, from own, owning and using. Let me just scroll that down a bit more. But empirically, the distinctions don't always hold up. Richens and Dawson 1992, consumer values orientation for materialism and its measurement, scale development validation, journal of customer research. So he's basically saying there's, there's plenty of research here that talks it's about the considerations. Research. It's kind of interesting because um, there's a whole field of consumer research and there's a whole field of behavioral economics and there's a whole field of positive psychology and they kind of overlap on this issue about what's going on here. And I think, um, I, I, as I said, it's complex. There, you know, there are um, lots of contentious issues, but ultimately, um, these behaviors are very much, I think, shaped and uh, by cultures. Yeah. And I, and I think what I'm trying to do with this book and with these these talks is just to um, put a light upon maybe some of the more unrecognized motivations for why people do these sorts of things. Yeah. And, and ultimately, I do think we need to change our consumption behavior. I'm not suggesting we become communists and disavow everything. But I do think, given the choice, do we really need to renew things for the latest model? Um, because yeah. marketeers, they know our weaknesses. Uh, and the people on clickbait, who, who know, on social media, they know how to draw us in by social comparison. And so we just yeah. need to be aware of what motivates us to make that next purchase. Oh. Absolutely. Okay, well, we're going from the confessional to politics now. The triangle of mine, yours and shared is a big idea politically. My house, mm -hmm. our town, our NHS. Where does privatization fit in? <laughs> well, I wish I was in a position of power to make a kind of judgment on that. Um, privatization, I... I I, I think I'd be definitely stepping beyond my expertise bounds there. Uh, and I, I, I'll leave it for you guys to, 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 to discuss that because I, I mean, I have my own personal views. Uh, I, I tend more to the left, um, but I don't think I'm knowledgeable enough to say anything of any informed opinion, which is greater than anyone else's expertise out there. That's, that's very diplomatic, Bruce. So yeah, that's fine. Uh, the another question is uh, that's come in is relating about the illusion of self. And do we really construct ourselves through our possessions? Uh, partly, yes. I believe so. I think the, uh, and, and this is really another talk. <laughs> uh, the self, it, it depends on what you define the self as. I, I think that's part of the problem that people have with the, the title of that book. First of all, the word illusion um, suggests that there's nothing. I, I'm not suggesting that. An illusion technically is uh, an experience which is not what it seems. OK, that's what illusions are. And the experience I'm challenging that I think many people have is that their self is an integrated, coherent individual with free will who is rationally making choices and in control. And I would suggest that on everything I just said there, you could challenge with a whole lot of um, uh, neuropsych uh, and uh, physiological and, and sheer logic that um, there can't be a integrated individual. And all the evidence, in my opinion, suggests that we are constructed we're like a narrative and the flow of, and by the way self is it can be the sense of self in the, the here and now the flow of consciousness that we're all experiencing right now it can also be an autobiography autobiographical sense of the self is yeah. who am i and you might say well aren't they the same thing well no if you've ever met anybody or know anybody who has uh, dementia 
you can see a fragmentation between their sense of being in the here and now and their previous sense of identity. Yeah. And so we know that identity can fragment. Uh, it, does, it can be disease, drugs, or damage to the brain. The yeah. sense of the self can be broken up. So if it can be deconstructed like a clock, I suppose, then my, my belief is that we are constructed over a lifetime through developmental processes and, and partly genetic processes as well. So yeah. that's what I mean by the self-illusion, that it's a yeah. very convenient way of thinking but it's actually not probably the reality. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, no, that's fine. So are you saying effectively that we are uh, an emerging process of yes. becoming individuals rather than a static individual at any one point in time? Yes, so the way I think about it, if you think about the internal workings of the mind, and I think most people agree that the brain is composed of a multitude of functions and abilities and, yeah. and memories and whatever, and if you think about the multitude of information in the external world that we have to navigate, people, places, information, whatever, we have a line of consciousness which tends to be serial, okay? We don't, we, we feel that we're processing everything at once, but actually we're only attending to one thing at a time. And so I think that the sense of self, that flow of consciousness is the interface between parallel content bases. Yeah. So you have a lot of parallel processes. Most of them are unconscious. We don't, we're not even aware of our yeah. face processing, our language processing, or all these things that we know from experimental psychology are actually discrete processes. And we're only barely aware of the complexity of the external world. And yet we seem to navigate that in a very coherent way. And that's because the self is this constructed serial interface between yeah. parallel worlds. Okay, that was great. Uh, we still got to put one more political question that's just come in. So, right. But I think it's, it's slightly less uh, contentious, which is uh, probably more research based. And that's from Kevin. Do people on the left demonstrate a different relationship to their possessions than people on the right? I don't know the answer to that. I, I would expect my hunch is yes. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm, I would be guessing yes. And, and I'm basing that only on the likelihood of um, capitalist societies, which tend to be uh, much more focused on material possessions relative to more socialist societies, where they tend to be a little bit more, you know, interdependent. Yeah. So I, I would think that's quite likely. Okay, good. Look, we've, uh, we've finished the questions in the chat room. And unless there's any more questions, then I shall pass you uh, over to Don to finish off. The last thing I want to mention, just in case Don forgets, is that next month's talk is also going to be done on Zoom and it's actually going to be delivered by Don himself on scientific philosophy. So watch out for that. But I now hand you over to Don to close. And thank you very much again, Bruce, for an excellent talk. Thank you, Andreas. Sorry about the technical fault, but we managed no to get it together. <laughs> And I think it remain, remains for me only to say thank you very much, Bruce, for for a, a most interesting talk. And I think uh, of all the talks that we've had in the over the years, it's perhaps been the most fun. But, <laughs> but um, it's certainly it's, the uh, most uh, certainly it, the most certainly uh, thought provoking. Uh, I think we'll all be going <laughs> to 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 declutter our homes after this. Okay, so thank, thank you very much, much indeed. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Have a good... Stay safe. Bye-bye, everyone.